Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Our guest host this week is Dr. Erica Schwartz. For more than 20 years, Dr. Erica has been at the forefront of advanced patient care, taking the best of conventional and integrative medicine and applying them to prevent disease. Dr. Erica is a distinguished AFRM faculty member in disciplines ranging from hormone therapy, peptide therapy, and IV nutritional support. Welcome to Redefining Medicine. And we're so thrilled to have Dr. Neil Barnard with us today. It's the most exciting thing I've done yet. <laughs> Um, Dr. Barnard is the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and the author of many books on nutrition, including his latest, Your Body in Balance, The New Science of Food, Hormones, and Health. Dr. Barnard's research, funded by the National Institutes of Health, paved the way to viewing type 2 diabetes as a potentially reversible condition for many people. In his latest study, his research team found a way to knock out menopausal hot flashes for many women just using simple diet changes. We are so happy to have you with us, Dr. Barnard. Well, thank you. It's been great to be here. It's our pleasure. So at A4M, 30th Annual Spring Congress, um, your lecture is titled, Your Body and Balance, The New Science of Food, Hormones, and Health. Can you please give our audience some insight about the topic? Sure. Um, the old way of practicing medicine, which is kind of still current for a lot of people, is you think, all right, um, if we're going to talk about food at all, it's you ate a bad food and you get a disease. So you eat too many calories and you get overweight, or you eat too much cholesterol and you get a heart attack. But what I have been trying to do is to think everything in our body is controlled by a hormone or many hormones, like your blood sugar is controlled by insulin and, and reproductive function is controlled by estrogens and testosterone and energy is controlled by thyroid hormone. Could it be that we can use foods to change the way hormones work? And the answer is this huge yes. Um, you, you can't accept that most people don't have an owner's manual for how to do that, but it, it's not really complicated. Um, so and what, I, what we talked about this morning was here's why insulin isn't working so hot in a person with diabetes, here's how to make it work better. Here's how estrogen is going off the rails in a woman with say menstrual pain or endometriosis or, or how estrogen shifts are causing menopausal symptoms. Here's how foods can get them back on track and it's just super, super practical. It's not, this is not rocket science. This is, no. this is medical science which is a level down from rocket science. But it should be common sense because you are what you eat. You think about it from the ancient Greeks about you are what you eat. How come in conventional way of being trained in medicine, we don't understand that and we don't know anything about it? Yeah, well, I, it is partly understandable because some of it, um, well, first of all, as, as you know, we weren't really trained about nutrition in medical school. And that was true before, it's still true. Mm -hmm. There's. Um, but, but I, I could kind of forgive doctors a little bit uh, <laughs> for, for ignoring nutrition. Um, the first reason is doctors have seen diets in the past. There were kind of fad diets that didn't really work very well. And so they thought, I, I'm not going there. Right. You know, if I want to get your cholesterol down, there's nothing like Lipitor, that'll do it. So, um, however, they've gone too far mm -hmm. by rejecting nutrition because nutrition is often the cause of these issues. But, but even, even there, it's easy to get a little goofed up. For example, a person has diabetes. Right. Diabetes means you got a high blood sugar. And the patient comes in and, and they will say correctly that when they eat uh, sugary foods or starchy foods, their blood sugar goes up. So sure. it's natural that they would think that sugar was the cause of the whole thing. But as I explained in my lecture, the cause is something you probably wouldn't have expected. And that's that the cells of your body accumulate microscopic fat particles. And you think, how could that relate to diabetes? Well, what happens is the greasy onion rings and the salad oils and the greasy steak and chicken, all that kind of stuff, the fat particles get into your cells. And as the fat builds up inside the cell, 
then insulin doesn't work anymore. I insulin attaches to a muscle cell, but it's like a sort of like a key in a lock that's jammed up with chewing gum. It just won't work. The key won't, there's, there's nothing wrong with the key, but the key will not work. Right. And so insulin can't work if the cells have been filled with fat. So paradoxically, the patient never thought that all those fatty foods were a problem, and the doctor never thought so either. But NIH funded us to test this Beautiful. out, and it, and it works really well when you get the junk out of the diet. And when I, now, but the diet that we've used for diabetes it's a vegan diet. It's no animal products at all. And that's something that, you know, the patients think you're going to turn them into a hippie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to wear tie-dye clothes now. I'm going vegan. But the explanation for it is I want to get rid of all the animal fat if I'm going to cure you. And, and, you know, you do not need animal fat. Um, we're going to keep oily foods, even, even kind of healthy oils, we keep them low. And that allows the fat to get out of the cell. The insulin works again. The patient's blood sugar goes brrrr down even though they're eating carbohydrates and things and, and they're not changing their exercise patterns. And we started to see something we'd never seen before, which is diabetes going away. Sure. So anyway, my point is doctors can be forgiven a little because you wouldn't necessarily know that fat accumulated in your muscle cells unless you had a magnetic resonance scanner. And most offices can't afford that, so they wouldn't have any idea. But that's why people like you are so important, because you're teaching, you're educating. Which brings me to you being a vegan for 40 years. So what made you decide to be a vegan and how did that now translate into your perspective and how you're looking at healthcare? Yeah, I'll tell you, I, I grew up in North Dakota. I never met a vegetarian, never heard the word, sure. ve <laughs> never, heard, never heard the word vegan, nothing at all. Um, and to this day, I wouldn't say I'm a vegan. What I would say is my foods are all vegan foods. I'm still the same guy. Um, as I always was. In, in other words, I would use the, the, the term not to apply to a person, but to more to apply to their food choices. Right. So a person eats a vegan diet. The, right. re the reason I say that is if a patient reverses their diabetes by eating vegan foods, it, it, they're still the same old person. They, they may not think of themselves as a different person. But they're healthier. Oh my God, <laughs> absolutely. But what, what hit me, I gotta tell you, the year before I went to medical school, I was working in Minneapolis. There's a big hospital there called Fairview Hospital. And my job was in the basement in the morgue. And Ooh. I was the autopsy assistant. A patient would die in the hospital, sometimes from eating hospital food, but that's a different story. We and, know and, that. <laughs> anyway, true. We, this is a true story. We, mm -hmm. a, a man died in the hospital of a massive heart attack. And the pathologist knew that I was going to go to medical school. So in addition to having me be his assistant, he also kind of took me on as his student. And so he cut a big chunk of ribs off the chest of this poor dead body and put the ribs on the tabletop, and that exposed the heart. And he said, Neil, I want you to look inside. And he sliced open a coronary artery. And I had gloves on. He said, stick your finger in there. And I could feel the calcifications of, you know, in, in this artery. And you could, it was just like, you could see this being like a death sentence that had been in his artery for who knows how long, right. and they finally killed him. Um, and then he said, look in the carotids. Look in the arteries going to the kidneys. And you saw this systemic atherosclerosis. Anyway, it made an impression on me. And we talked about what causes this. And of course, this is not caused by genetics for the most part. It's caused by bacon, eggs, whatever. He leaves the room. I got to clean up. So I clean up the body, I take the ribs, I put them back in the chest, I sewed up the skin, and it was a long day. So I went up to the cafeteria, and when I approached the cafeteria, they were serving ribs for lunch. Ooh. And so here's your, here's your ribs. And I, Ooh. it looked, ex <laughs> it, just, it, was, it was just like the dead body, and it smelled like it. <sighs> and I thought, where's the salad bar? So I didn't become a vegetarian on the spot, but that got me thinking, and it was just a turn off. But the background, I mean, I grew up in the Midwest, and my extended family raised cattle. I myself drove cattle to the slaughterhouse in East St. Louis. Um, I hunted and all that kind of stuff. But for me, it was a really good wake-up call, and good in every way. And I have found that now I'm in Washington, D.C., where I went to medical school, and pretty much stayed ever since. And the foods that I eat are more varied and more exciting. When I was in Fargo, I never, you know, we'd never had, 
I mean, even an Italian restaurant was like an amazing, <laughs> amazing exotic thing. We didn't have Sichuan food or Hunan food or Indian food or Korean food or Japanese. We didn't have any of that stuff. Right. And now the plant-based choices are everywhere. And if somebody said, you could go back and have a pork chop, I'd say, I might feed that to my cat, but I don't need to. I mean, cats are carnivores. They do well with that. But, you know. Like, yeah, well, I think, listen, you paved the way to turning around and saying diabetes, type 2 diabetes is reversible. So tell me about the book, the new book, where you're talking about it and your body in balance to new science of food, hormones, and health. Yes, um, insulin was the first door in for us because we found right. that if you've got insulin but it's not working, rather than just try to compensate with medicines, let's get your insulin working again. So that's what we did. That was our NIH trial. The American Diabetes Association, to, the, to their credit, published it first, and I spoke at their conference, and we found a lot of people are now in, really interested in this, especially the yeah. patients who say, if I can do it without medicine, man, let's do that. Um, that doesn't mean you don't need medicine sometimes. Sometimes you may, but let's minimize it. But then we started to look at estrogens. And we started to discover. My next question. <laughs> well, you'd think, um, uh, I, I got a phone call just out of the blue. It was a young woman who had really bad menstrual pain, as m many women will. And she was the daughter of an, another doctor who I had known for years in another part of the country. And her, her daughter was here. She was in Washington. And her mother said, call Dr. Brownard. He'll, he'll help you. She said, I can't get out of bed. She had just terrible pain. And so she wanted Demerol. You know, a, a How old was she? Uh, you know, she's maybe early 20s or mm -hmm. s something like that. Um, and so I said, you know, let me, I'll give you some heavy duty painkillers for a couple of days, sure. But um, we, what, what after that? You know, after two days, we got to figure out how to make this not happen again. So anyway, I remembered the literature on breast cancer. Breast cancer can be driven by hormones. And so I thought, how am I going to modulate hormones with diet? And so what we did was we used a diet that was really low in fat, really high in fiber, knocked out her, her menstrual pain. And so then we started doing clinical trials on this and found that it was very effective. Um, by that I mean, if a woman has really bad, just cramps, or endometriosis, which is often off the scale type cramps, if she greatly increases the fiber content in, of her diet, her estrogen level will modulate a little bit. If she reduces, what I'm, I wanna make sure I'm saying this right, increase fiber, mm -hmm. reduce fat, her estrogen will get back in balance, her pain may go away or improve. And then we started looking at estrogen shifts at, at menopause. Mm -hmm. And we found, holy cow, you can do something very similar there. Here the difference was, it was not just no animal products, oil's really low, but we added soybeans. Which, talk about a controversial food. People love them, they hate them, they're afraid of them, whatever. Very controversial. They are. But we started using them and found that we could knock out the moderate to severe hot, hot flashes by between 80 and 90 percent. And the women who had been up until that point just like kind of miserable um, really found their life just changing. Yeah, and you know, hot flashes and the frequency of hot flashes is kind of uh, the risk shows the risk for heart disease 10 years later and nobody's talking about that. So eliminating the hot flashes when they start is actually a life savior the same way as reversing diabetes as a life savior. In all, yes, and exactly. And in all of these things, we've stumbled into them by accident. Um, I really had no idea that diabetes would be something that would be reversible uh, for many patients. And I never, I really didn't have the idea that something like menstrual pain could work. These were, in, in some cases, they started with a hunch or an informed guess. But then you've got to do the research, and you've got to bring in lots of people, and you've got to test it under double-blind conditions if you can, or single, whatever you can do, to have it be as controlled as possible. Send it to peer-reviewed journals and let them chew it up. Um, and make sure you're right. Um, and that's what we've done. And, and then you can go further. You can look at things like thyroid disease, which is either caused by not getting enough iodine in your diet or, more commonly, an antibody action, mm -hmm. slowing the thyroid down, or in some cases, stomping it from being able to slow down. And diet seems to play a role there too. But this is the frontier. I think we need more good clinical trials in all these areas and see what works and what doesn't. And we need to teach the doctors. And that's what you're doing. 
You're teaching yes. the doctors. And many of them are really eager. Some of them are protecting their ignorance a little bit. Uh, but this too will well, change. They'll outgrow it. They'll, they'll outgrow it e for one of two reasons. Either their patients will say, can you tell me about this? I want to do this in my own life, or I've done this, and it's worked really, really well. I no longer need the insulin or whatever. Or what happens very often is a doctor changes his diet or her diet because they have issues that they want to get better. And once you've done it and you've, you've seen how it goes, you see not only that it's powerful, but it's actually really kind of fun and enriching, and, and the foods are good. And what you're doing seems so rewarding to you, and it's helping so many people. So you are a blessing to all of us, and I'm really grateful to be able to have met you and be able to share with the rest of us everything you bring to our table. It's been wonderful to be part of this team effort and seeing people who are really changing the way things are practiced and helping people and saving lives. Thank you, Dr. Barnett. Thank you.